I mean, you know, by the 80s and 90s, the rest of the world saying, well, America's really good at producing uh, rock and movies. That's what America was known for. But that was the main <laughs> software product of the day, of the 70s, yeah, 80s, 90s. Yeah. Music and movies. I mean, actually, thinking back on the, those thousand CDs, there was very few American, well, U.S.-based artists, you know. It was, it was mainly British, Canadian, um, yeah, but that's that's the global economy. The uh, yeah. the uh, what would you name a big company? So no, it's uh, CBS Records. They yeah. were everywhere on the planet, and you know the music might be uh, uh, from France or something, but it might have been on a CBS contract. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it still came out from the U.S. It was a world of international absurdities, which is, uh, mm -hmm. did you know that, Chad, that one of the companies, no, you wouldn't have seen the album. It's pretty interesting. He called himself. No, I knew that. Um, I don't know how I knew that, but I've seen it somewhere in, in the it's actually, context yeah. of looking through his music. Yeah, it's actually international continental absurdities, I think. It's three words. Intercontin intercontinental absurdities. Yeah, 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 that's what it is. Intercontinental. Now, there's that. I forgot. Mm. That's interfacing different continents. That's a satellite view. That's fucking it right there. Intercontinental absurdities. That's what the, the, the satellite overlords would see. Mm -hmm. See, it's uncanny how he... If you were a student of McLuhan, and you, and you get impressed with him in the 60s, and you want to make art that reflects him... You wouldn't do it better than Zappa, even though McLuhan had no clue that he was doing McLuhan. Yeah, it's funny that McLuhan never picked up on Zappa. Oh, yeah, no, here's, I mean, his son Eric did. And I, uh, Eric, I sat in his class at the Ontario Art College in 78, 79, and he was talking about manipulating satire or something close to that, and he mentioned uh, we're only for the money as a good example. And, you know, I'm sure he told his father. But, see, that was just a passing one, one album. That's I wonder if Frank could have uh, appreciated, if, if McLuhan could have appreciated Frank. I mean, there is a thing about McLuhan that feels like a straight guy. Oh, yeah. He has, a, he has amazing grace played at his funeral. <laughs> There's an ancient corny <laughs> song, right? <laughs> I mean, that's not too hip. <laughs> he, 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 he was... He was a 19th century guy and a Canadian. He wasn't uh, taken in the stuff, and that's why he was so detached. He'd take the Beatles. He did a whole do line on the Beatles' White Album, and he went through it and talked about it. But it's all this very, quote, abstract response to it. I mean, he's a, and it's very interesting on the big few, but he ain't hearing the music like a fan. He's just taking the cues of what the words and rhythms are retrieving. And uh, so he's like a scientist, and he's like an ancient sensibility. He's not, he's not uh, plugged into what the kids are plugged into. Doesn't even like it. He, the only, you know this story, right? The only rock concert he ever went to was Michael McClure, you know, the famous beatnik poet, took him to a Dylan concert in Toronto in 1974. And all through the concert, and now remember, McClure had hypersensitive ears because of his brain surgery, I wouldn't be surprised he had earplugs in, but all he did during the whole concert, and he didn't know any of the songs or anything, he just kept yelling, acoustic space has no center, acoustic space has no center. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's like a, a Gurk Gok, a guy who gives jerks a bad name. You know, he's, uh, he's not, he's an alien, so to speak. He's not hearing the content. He doesn't care. To him, there's not 50 kinds of snow. To you, Scott, or to James with those thousand CDs, that's 50 kinds of snow. You knew the differences. That would just be a pile of tape to McLuhan. He, he wouldn't be able to hear the differences in the music. It's interesting. Yeah, so that's, an, right. it's almost like Zappa, you know, it's the old, art is the Noah's Ark. It preserves what's best in the past. Um, you, so, and yet done in the style of the new. So Zappa does McLuhan in the new, Yet Z uh, McLuhan is the Noah's Ark saving the past. They they go together. Mm -hmm. So in my so remember this was orchestrated by me. So I have McLuhan being the guy who preserves the Noah's Ark part, and then I have Zappa expressing the present. The two together become the content of my art form, which we're just starting to realize what it is, right? <laughs> exactly. 
I mean, look at the meeting I have on June 18th, 1967, in my diaries, in the East Village at Stanley's, and you see I bring together Zatha McClellan, LaRouche, May Brussels, and everybody, and look at what they say to each other. There's no, there's no uh, common ground there. No, not at all. Yeah, how'd you get them all in the same room together since they didn't relate? Because they all knew me. <laughs> you see, here's the point. It was in 67. Zappa didn't know McLuhan yet. Uh, LaRouche did not McLu know McLuhan. Certainly McLuhan didn't know LaRouche. He was a nobody professor in uh, the Free University in Manhattan. Uh, Zappa's just beginning. None, none of them knew each other. None of, them, none of them were on each other's radar. They weren't significant. They weren't even oh, aware of Zappa it. Zappa would be the enemy from LaRouche's point of view. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, go and read. You know, someday we should go through that and read the different views each one has. They're not communicating, but they're just stating what they are and going to become. And, uh, I mean, Zappa, when I uh, turned him on to May Brussels in 1985, he didn't remember that she was at that restaurant. <laughs> and Beter was there. And Chris, now remember, they're all there to hear Christian Murdy, and they're all just interpreting Christian Murdy. It was almost like you were invited to go to some opera, some funk, city hall function in Perth, and they just randomly picked a bunch of people to go sit, listen to the mayor run some ideas by you. And you're sitting there with a bunch of other people you never met before, and you don't know who they are. That's the way it was for Frank. He was only showing up there <laughs> as my guest. He didn't know who these other people were. Yeah, he just had to listen to Krishnamurti, basically. No, they, they, none of them had heard Krishnam. None of them had heard Krishnamurti. Uh, so you you brought them all based based on that to hear Krishnamurti. Yeah, to hear Krishnamurti. I wanted to see what this guy, how much this guy was relevant to them or not relevant. <laughs> was Worcester there? No, no. And Garrett was there. Garrett's in the background. I mean, I could. A little later, look it up and read you the characters there. It's basically, everybody was there. Um, where, where was this again, the meeting? Place? It's a bar known as Stanley's, a famous bar in the East Village that Walter Bowett was a bartender for in 60, 61. Mm. And um, there's a book called... Uh, um, I can't remember. It's, it's a history of the Bohemian culture from the 20s up to the 60s by uh, Ronald Susanik or Suskinik, and he uh, he does this and he writes about the Stanleys being a place sort of after Cedar Tavern where the uh, the Beatnik painters Jackson Pollock and them hung around Cedar Tavern. Well, Stanley was Stanley's was the place either during that but definitely a little after. And then before you get into Max's Kansas City, in the Warhol scene. Mm. So to get back to the put a motor in you theme, I'm looking at the covers of Cheap Thrill and uh, Son of Cheap Thrill. And what you have is uh, each one has on the cover a uh, creature that's part flesh and but it's driven by uh, cogs and gears and wheels and fan belts. And um, so I don't know if that's going to get us that, back to where we no, were that, an hour ago. That, that's a really good image. I haven't thought about that one too much. That's a new image. I haven't looked at it much, but I'm, I have the album, so I remember it. But, yeah, it's a combination of of uh, Ant-Man B or Flesh and Cyborg and, Mich and Mechanical Man yeah this is primarily uh, Ant-Man it's primarily mechanical there's not a lot of electric, electrical uh, motor type stuff but what's it doing like. what's it doing well it's eyes are popping out of it's head but if you trace the the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, nerves of the eyes back into the head you see they're connected to one of them's connected to like a, cellulo a celluloid or solenoid thing which is really the only electrical component in there the other ones are cooked up to pressure valves and gears and wheels and fan belts and and bicycle chains that's all what's behind <clears throat> or under the surface under the fleshy exterior of this creature the down below if you open it up there's an image of a laboratory with all kinds of weird bugs and test tubes and 
microscopes and weird things going on down there. And then and and there's a panel that has a bunch of gauges on it, uh, uh, measuring temperatures and fuel flow and hydraulic activity and buttons and switches and knobs and stuff. And um, there's an image here driven that looks like it was drawn by uh, an artist. I can't remember his name right now. Who's the artist that, uh, let's see, did the cover of I Have... Have I Offended Somebody? Uh, um, it's um, Ralph Stedman, Stedman, the guy who used to do Hunter S. Thompson. Yeah, Ralph Stedman. Yeah, the guy who did Hunter S. Thompson. Yeah, he's got a drawing in here, which is really cool. <clears throat> okay, the... Um so what what years were these? Uh, was Cheap Thrills and Son of Cheap Thrills? What did they come out? Ten years ago. Oh really? Oh yeah, those those are new albums. You know, they have the look and feel. I always assume they were way early stuff because they have, for some reason, they have the look and feel of something that he was doing like in the early '60s. Yeah, it's not him. It's probably Cal Schenkel's art. They always hired Cal to bring back that old uh, atmosphere. Oh. Cal Schenkel. So here's the thing. You, I would notice in Uncle Meat, I mean, the symbol for uh, Bizarre Records was that um, vacuum pump. Do you remember? How do you describe that, James? It's an industrial thing, right? This little yeah, yeah, flat, transparent thing. He would have yeah. industrial uh, nuts and bolts kind of stuff. He didn't have the electronic stuff too much. and what? So he actually was doing what what the normal artists could do, uh, could, you know, critiquing the industrial phase, the Ant-Man phase. And, uh, but there were hints of the electronic fact, like his hand coming through the album cover and, and modulating the scene from a studio uh, pods. Uh, he seemed to indicate the electronic, but you could, McLuhan might point out, if he looked at the album covers and, and listened, he said, a mm, little too much of mechanical imagery here he's satirizing. He doesn't know how to satirize the electronic environment. And, and that that might be true. That's what I thought. I mean, from my refined perspective of a Tetra manager, is that he um, was he only accidentally satirized the electronic situation. But what do you expect? The guy's a you know young guy, and he's in the rock culture. I mean, he, hold on. In 1970, he released Burnt Weenie Sandwich. And yeah. The cover of that one is covered in like electronic uh, circuitry. That's right. And he's got the little hints there. And he's got the font that he uses for the album title, Burmese Sandwich, is in like that uh, electronic sort of, um, what is it, LED or LCD kind of font. No, that's right. I, he, he was aware of the, um, the structure. Uh, I mean, basically showing the back of a radio. Doesn't he, doesn't he say somewhere, turn your radio transistor around and look at the back of it? He kind of says something like that. So that's where I would say he was tactile. Those little hints implied that he was, you know, getting close to being a good McLuhan student, you know, and, uh, but you couldn't talk to anybody about it, but that's what I would think. And um, yet overall, okay, look at this way. He seemed to have an obvious mechanical robot, the mechanical part. But if you look closely, he was including as a subtle ground the electronic components, right? Yeah, which is pretty clever. Um, here, I found the quote. This is the uh, the interview. Uh, it's a Warner promo circular, Warner Company, 1971. It's called, In Case You've Never Heard of Our Group. Hi, we're the MOI, M-O-I, which is me, French for me, Mothers of Invention, or just plain mothers. We like to make that clear so you don't get us confused with the Mothers Brothers campaign that Herbie called you guys about and said, what's the deal? And he goes on joking. But down here, it's a good thing to read. Then he says, uh, the, the interviewer, fake executive interviewer, saying, yeah, sure, I'm, spo I'm supposed to sell records for you guys, and I'm a little pressed for time, so why don't you just tell me normal stuff, like what your, like what your group sounds like, maybe, maybe. And Zappa says, what we sound like is more that what, sorry, what we sound like is more that what we sound like. More than, they got that misspelled. What we sound like is more than what we sound like. Now there's pointing to tactility, right? There's my case right there. 
Yeah. I haven't read this in 30 years. What we sound like is more than what we sound like. We're not just what the ear stuff. We are part of the project slash object. The project Would that slash be like they're part of the environment? Uh, wait a minute. Let's finish the whole quote. We are part of the project slash object. The project slash object, in brackets, maybe you like event slash organism better. So he says the project object, object incorporates any available visual medium, consciousness of all participants, including audience, so that means he's got ESP almost, all perceptual deficiencies, that's bias, sensory bias, totally McLuhanist, God, in brackets, as energy, the big note, in brackets, as universal basic building material, and other things. <laughs> and other things. <laughs> we make, and it's quite inclusive there, right? Yeah. What? What? What say, no, I, ju I just said moon masons. <clears throat> yeah. We make a special art in an environment hostile to dreamers. So the executive says, I still don't get it. Art? What art? Rolling Stone magazine and all other groovy important publications have convinced me that you guys are nothing more than a bunch of tone-deaf perverts faking it on the fringe of the real rock and roll world. All you guys do is play comedy music. So I should believe this crap about a conceptual program spanning decades? <laughs> Zappa, Zappa says yes. Zappa goes yes, you should believe this. And, and then the guy says, you've been doing this stuff for seven years. Zappa says, almost 10 years if you include pre-planning. See? Petre Mander, knowing the effects before. So then the guy says, so why didn't I ever... So why didn't I ever know about any of this stuff? I'm aware and intelligent in everything. <laughs> I'm aware and intelligent in everything. How come you never mention it? Zappa says, there are several possible reasons. One, maybe you never asked because you never heard in the album, so perhaps the long-range continuity would not occur to you. Two, maybe you never asked because you never saw the mothers perform live, and the conceptual aspects of this phase could not be described without you having seen many concerts. Three, maybe you never, maybe you never read any interviews. Now this is it. See, the interviews are part of the comp composition. Maybe you never read any interviews where this phenomenon was briefly described, producing varying degrees of semantic confusion. Four, maybe now is when you should know. See, there's the uh, the timing aspect. <laughs> Maybe now is when he should know. Now, he says, you never, um, you never saw the mothers perform live, and the, and the conceptual aspects of this phase could not be described without you having seen many concerts. Uh, I like to say uh, that I was the first person that I've told, maybe in other sessions, first person to ask him about the conceptual continuity in 1970. It was that, that week of the Olympia Auditorium, I was at his place. And they brought up something, a uh, very esoteric, strange thing. And he said, no, he denied it. But right after that, he knew, uh-oh, it's getting out there. Bob said that, so that's a clue, a barometer. So I like to say I was the first to get onto it. Now, Miles, the uh, British journalist who did a book on Zappa recently, he was the first journalist to really uh, you know, get into the deeper Zappa. He kind of picked up on it around then, uh, if you read some interviews he did with Zappa. But, um, okay, so then the guy goes, so, so when Frank goes, maybe now is when you, maybe now is when you should know. And, and the guy goes, he gets scared, he goes, what is it, like a plot or something? <laughs> this is beautiful. <laughs> In terms of him running for uh, president, too. Uh, so he says, not exactly, meaning not exactly a plot or something. What I'm trying to describe is the type of attention given to each lyric, melody, arrangement, improvisation, the sequence of the these elements in an album, the cover art, which is an extension of the musical material, the choice of what is recorded, released, and or performed during a concert, the continuity or contrast of material album to album, etc., etc., etc. All of these detailed aspects are part of the big structure or the main body of work. The smaller details comprise not only the contents of the main body of work, but because of the chronology of execution, give it a shape, shape in quotes, give it a shape in an abstract sense. So the guy says, so you say you're aware of the overall shape. He has a quote, overall, it's in quotes. So you say you're aware of the overall shape of the group's, of the group's output so far? Zappa says, I say we're not only aware of it, we control it. It is an intentional design. See, total programmed environment. See, McLuhan defined art as programmed environment. He's doing it. So 
So then he says, the guy says, you think this makes the mothers better than some other group? You know, all this crazy stuff Frank said. <laughs> And so he says it ma- it makes the mothers different. Certainly, we do not con- we do not claim that control of conceptual continuity automatically ensures superiority on any level. <laughs> the guy the guy goes what? <laughs> he just goes what? <laughs> and Frank, have you ever read this, uh, Chad? No, is that actually another guy, or is he just being... No, he wrote it. No, he wrote it. Yeah. He, 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 he just, it's like that interview where he has that guy looking like him interviewing him. You know, it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a contrived art situation and a satirical situation. So the guy goes, what? And, and so Frank says, this is, a silly, this is a silly analogy, however. Okay, the guy goes, what? Doesn't even understand. He, he's responding to, we do not claim that control and conception continuity automatically ensures superiority. <laughs> the guy goes, what? Like, I, it does not compute. So he goes, this is a silly analogy. However, imagine the head of a pin. On the head of this pin is an amazingly detailed illustration of some sort. <laughs> Just of some sort. The content's not that relevant, right? An amazingly detailed illustration. I'll get Cal Shakel to make up some ridiculous design, but, it's good, but it'll be detailed. He doesn't say Cal Shakel, but that's like meaning when he says, that's what I'm thinking of when he says, of some sort. It might be a little thought or a feeling. Talk about homeopathic. It might be a little thought or a feeling or perhaps an obscure symbol. It might just be a picture of a sky or something with birds in it. (laughs) But it's on the head of this pin, remember? And it's infinitely detailed. Now, imagine this pin is not a pin. (laughs) It's a musical note with a corresponding physical action, like the secret raising of an eyebrow to add special emphasis. (laughs) Even... (laughs) And that's what Zappa was notorious for raising his eyebrow, right? So he goes... Yeah, so it's a cor- there's a musical note with a corresponding physical action like the raising of an eyebrow. Now, there's synesthesia, a multiple whole body in action. It's not just the, the physical kinetic movement is as equally important as the musical note, right? So he goes, and this is even, um, he goes, it's a musical note with a corresponding physical action like the secret raising, secret raising of an eyebrow to add special emphasis, even in a recording studio where nobody can see you. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Is he just, I mean, being, uh, is he just being ridiculous about details, like to make a point? No, he, he's doing it. He's being McLuhan esque, man. He's being Finnegan East. He's being a, a genius here. I mean, this is beautiful. He, he's, he's covered. He's covered all the bases, basically. Yeah, he's covered all. It's a it's a CIA plot, you know. It's a, so then he continues. Yeah. So he's saying all this secret stuff is being in a place you can't see you because he knows everything's disappeared, right? Well, and does, so does he? Yeah, he knows that you're operating in a void no matter what you're doing because it's a uh, beginning of the Android meme. Okay, so he says, now, imagine enough of these abstracted pins, in brackets, with the needle part chopped off to save space, (laughs) so they're just a little fucking head of the pin, I guess. Now Now imagine enough of these abstracted pins to fill an area as large as the North American continent and most of Central Europe, piled to a depth of 80 feet. Now that would be like a trillion pinheads, right? Uh, and, and then, that, Bob. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and there's your intercontinental absurdities. North American continent, capitalized, and most of Central Europe. Yeah, and Central Europe is where the Transylvania stuff is, you know what I mean? The, the torture never stops, that old aristocratic stuff that he puts in there. So he says, you know, the evil castle, evil prince. So he goes, uh, now, he wants you to imagine all, the, all enough, enough of these abstract opinions for that zone. Then he says, now, imagine this area is not geometric space. Now, no, that's a very good statement, you know what I mean? Because it's not visual space. Now, imagine this area is not geometric space. Imagine a collection of decades. In brackets, the exact number to be disclosed eventually. (laughs) (laughs) This is where I got my decade dance. This this stuff is embedded in my chart, you know what I mean? Uh, imagine a collection of decades. I have um, decade hyphen dance or decadence or decade dance, right? So now he's spanning. He's sp- this is like I- updating ionization, what we went into last thing, right? He's getting closer to Bob's chart. Imagine a collection of decades. 
the exact number to be disclosed eventually. <laughs> Not to be disclosed right away. And then he, and then he goes, pause. He puts in, he ends a sentence, and then he has another sentence that just says pause. I guess he's letting the guy catch his breath or something. Now, that could be the tactile interval. It's just interesting. He has the word pause there as part of the, uh, which indicates you're reading something that's being done orally. So he writes in. It's like a Finnegan's, Finnegan's Wake thing. Joyce would put in sensory signals. So as if you were seeing a live person, he would put that in the, in the text. <laughs> That's, that's, that's maybe him raising his eyebrow. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, you know, after he said this, he's looking at the guy, and, and the guy's just, you know, yeah. floored, right? And he's giving him a yeah. secret wink almost, nudge, nudge. So then he goes, the reason for explaining this process is to simply yet let you know it exists and to give you <laughs> as an executive. <laughs> like, and also, it's like, I say it, it is. He's naming it. Yeah. And to give yeah. you, as an executive, some criteria by which to rationally judge what we do. It is not fair to our group to review detailed aspects of our work without considering the placement, and that's in italics, the placement of a detail in the larger structure. So he's asking the executive to understand the conception continuity <laughs> and be amazed at the genius of why Bert Weedy's sandwich should be released in 1970 and not in 68. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it great? And it's also... That, that's gold. That's gold, though. That's really good. You've never read this. No, not even no, you, the great Zappa scholar, had not read this. Nope. <laughs> okay, I will send it to you, but the, the, the point is, what was I going to say? Remember, you know, in his late, well, early 20s, 1662, in that period, he's working in an ad agency, and he's learning. This is ad kind of talk. You know what I mean? This is trying to create a market. Or, yeah, green here. But no, he gets to see how things are, you know, uh, set up, effects and causes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he yeah. picks it up instinctively. He watches it as he's in, a, in the uh, industry himself, just like Warhol. And I said years ago, oh, who would that be? That's Scott? Chad. Chad dropped out. Chad dropped out. Okay, so let's, let's, let's wait till it comes in. Um, what can we talk about in the meantime? Here's something well, for you, Bob. Bob. I oh. have a, uh, the... the uh, an album that was released called Mofo Project Object. Have you ever? Did you ever find out what the answer was to who is the brain police? I uh, know he. Remember, he doesn't answer in an interview, and he dies uh, shortly after. It's answered in here. But what is it? it? Oh, I'm going to tell you. It's, uh, is this a quote? Uh, no. Is this a quote from Zappa? Quote from from. Uh, hold on. Matt Groening. <clears throat> Says, oh, Matt Groening, that, Matt Groening, that, you know, the yeah. creator of Simpsons. Yeah. Says that when he saw Zappa live in 1971 with the Flo and Eddie mothers, they played Who Are the Brain Police? But this time, Groening says, Zappa answered the most important question in the song. The last line was, You are the brain police. Okay, so he, he says that in 1971. Yeah, he says Zappa said that at the when he finished singing, uh, doing that, performing that piece. Right now, that would be a content for that night, because you have to remember what he says to Bob Marshall. I'm still working on that. I haven't figured it out yet, or I'm not ready to release yeah, it yet. He's like the clever Zen guy that wants you to figure it out. For he's like Ion. He's not going to tell you. You're going to have to. Yeah. No, he but he hasn't figured it out himself. And that's good. He I was pointing know. out that... It, now, that's a big... The technique of suspended judgment... the answer. You are the exactly. brain police. Who else is the brain police? If it no, is? no, no. Is it... Here... Okay. Uh, you might... Is that hey. Scott? The uh, Chad back? Yeah. Yeah, I, I came back. It said uh, this conference is now being recorded when I came back in. Does that yeah, that means they're just telling you that it's in... They're just telling you it's in the process of, of already recording. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Should we go over that again, Scott? It's important. Uh, can you say it real fast? No, I'll say it fast. Matt Groening. Um, Scott is quoting Matt Groening saying he attended a Zappa concert in 71, and at the end of the song, uh, Who Are the Brain Police? Zappa said, You are the brain police. Okay. And I'm saying you then compare that to what he says to Bob Marshall in 1988 where he 
can't tell us who the brain police is, he's still working on it. Now here's the sophisticated McLuhan response. The discovery of the 19th century was the discovery of how to make discoveries. The discovery of the, t of the 20th century is the technique of suspended judgment. Now Zappo, if he's clued in to the suspended judgment or the, the attitude of the tetrad manager, you don't come up with an answer. You just put the question out to create, to grow the piano so people can write books on it and make money for you. So, so the, or make money for the system. So who are the brain police is a, is a pot, you approach that question and you answer it by showing all the possible answers Think of all that, any available medium and blah, 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 all that stuff you list as your content because it's not any particular content. It's the way it's processed in the Android meme that is the involving seduction and, and tactile seduction. The, the mystery landscape is when you can name the brain police. The mystery landscape, now McLuhan says in the, in the early, in 54, and in one of his great essays, that we have now extended the essential mystery of the human cognitive process. We've extended it. And that means the tactile process of the brain has been extended with television. So we started to oh, extend... the central nervous system has extended with television. The no, no, no. Any, yeah. any, any brain... Hey, hey. <laughs> Wait, are you questioning the great McClellan archivist? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, any, any brain functions are extended with the, are extended with the chip. The television is just pure sensory extension. Look, okay, you, you, you can go on, but you're wrong. Now, let me tell you how you're wrong. McLuhan never talks about, uses the word mystery, maybe in a couple of places. And when he, in 1954, which is just starting to talk about things carefully planned, he's now putting out the Explorations Journal in 54, and he's going to give some hidden ground to what he's really doing. He's going to tell everybody electricity is an extension of the uh, central nervous system, or television is, but he's going to now one time tell you that that's the essence of his metaphysics of uh, understanding psychology and cognition and our sensory interaction. He says, we've extended the mystery of the human creative process. Now look at that. That's a pretty fucking amazing statement. And he only says it once. That's where you note the difference than the standard cliche that TV is an extension of the central nervous system. Even you know that, Scott. So this point is, why does he say mystery? What is it? A mystery of. Now then you say, uh, uh, James, something about the mystery landscape becomes identified? Yes. Well, yeah, 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 sorry. Um, you wouldn't know who the brain police are until the mystery landscape is, arrives. Uh, no, no, you, you could, if you understand, this is, if you understand that Finney's Wake shows you who the brain police are by, and as I said many times, the MK Ultra group the CIA used Finnegan's Wake as a model for uh, collective national programming because you create a quicksand reality of constant change. The only constant is change. And mm -hmm. becoming a, an adept and having poise in this upsetting world where every bunch, it's always a new innovation is upsetting you. Uh, and if you're subject to the illusion of each innovation, you'll get thrown. But if you see mm -hmm. that a rapid series of innovations is an airsat to any environment, you're in a poised position of understanding the process of change. And that is the tetradic position and how you use the technique of suspended judgment. And that is the brain police in many levels. So uh, I Fair rest enough. my complex. Fair enough. That's, that's, yeah. that's good. I, that's good. Yeah, I rest my complicated case. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, well, yeah. I guess, you know, if you could add to it and say there could be other levels to the, the brain police, but that... That was good news. Yeah, there's other ways for me to talk about it, but I, just yeah, get it yeah. on the record one intriguing level. So Frank is kind of aware of this. Not He wouldn't go maybe metaphysically say this is the extent of the human creative process, but he knows and he proves this in Biofa, the way he lays that out, because that's the whole process right there. So, so the guy, he lays out, he says, uh, we just want you to review detail aspects of our work without considering the placement, italicized, the placement of a detail no, it's not fair that you don't review without considering the placement of a detail in the larger structure. Then the guy says, why don't you guys just play rock and roll like everybody else and forget all this other crap? <laughs> <laughs> now look, look what's that. It's so tetrad managerially, he, what he says. Sometimes we do play rock and roll like everybody else, in brackets, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> but the important thing is sometimes, see Quadrophenic. 
We're not just limited to that. Sometimes we do play rock and roll like everybody else, sort of. Our basic stylistic determination is rock. Only sometimes it gets extrapolated into curious realms. Isn't that incredible? So the guy says, you probably get into that classical rock. (laughs) He thinks the guy that Frank stopped being classical rock or something, which was just starting to come in then. You, the nostalgia industry was just starting up. So he says, you pr-, the guy says, you probably get into that classical rock, in classical rock in quotes. Then he goes, real intellectual with ugly chords and the beat's no good. <laughs> so maybe, so he's actually remembering what the mothers were part of in 66, 67. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's called classical yeah, yeah. rock by the three years later. Real intellectual. Yeah, this would be like the 13th elevator or something, right? Uh, where, yeah, the drums don't work. He, he, he didn't really like Jimmy Carl Black's drums too much. Yeah, yeah, real intellectual with ugly chords and the beat's no good. Zappa says, any "Any association we might have with, quote, serious music, unquote, has to be considered from a rock viewpoint because most of us are strictly rock musicians. There is also the element of humor to consider. So the guy says, you guys could never really play any good rock and roll. You're not serious enough. So see, so you're seeing that this whole attempt by Zappa is going to fail, right? So this is the conclusion. You guys could never really play any good rock and roll. You're not serious enough. You couldn't even play any good serious music because you're not serious enough. <laughs> Have you even considered employment in another field? <laughs> So Zappa says, I would like to bring to your attention at this time one of the basic tenets of our group philosophy, and this is in big letters. It is, in spite of all evidence to the contrary, theoretically possible to be heavy, in quotes, heavy, and still have a sense of humor. And then he puts in brackets, we direct this specifically toward people who suffer feelings of ambivalence when given an opportunity to laugh at themselves. Then he says, and another, and this is the important part, and another precept which guides our work, and this is the last line, in big letters, somebody in that audience out there knows what we're doing, and that person is getting off on it beyond his, her wildest comprehensions. Yeah, Bob. That's right. (laughs) That's right. It's like a a consultation with the homeopathic doctor. (laughs) That's right. It's, It's awesome. And uh, if you don't know that, well, you guys have to study that over the next week and bring that into our uh, deliberations. Yeah. You know, there were many... It, this what? brings us all the way back to what we first talked about in the, with regard to doing your thing. I think we yes. actually stayed on topic. We've been tangential, but at the same time really yeah. uh, teased this out. Yep. Yeah, no, we, you never get off topic with Dobbs Down. The digressions are always pre-planned and theoretically humorous. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm saying yeah, it's, it's actually, it's humorous. this is a very good performance of that very geometry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Geometry, good with the geometry. Brain police would be the new kind of geometry. Seeing yourself not as an abstract design, but to what you do, what, what cars you drive, what media you use, that's your new geometry. And that's why I have Finnegan's Wake in the geometry uh, section of the Ten Holy Offices or the geometry section of the Trivium and Quadrivium because geometry is more than just some image. It's your environment. Well, I, I just had a thought. If, if Ion got asked who are the brain police, he would say, never mind. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, I think he would. So, so look at this. Some, now, what's this mean? Because just before this, <coughs> in November 70, in some New York rock magazine, an early one, he, he says, um, he's laying out what they're doing and going to do in 200 motels. It's early, may not be exactly how 200 motels um, is going to happen, but he's describing some other media project. And he says... Now, the goal is to get them, get somebody or anybody or somebody. If they, we get them way out there, the goal is, is to get them back. That's what he said. It's an incredible statement. Yes, we're going to send people way out there, but we want to get them back. And why does he want to get them back? To mobilize on a practical level and take over the United States government. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
potentially that is the answer. Um, so, so he's talking about getting getting one person or get the person who gets into this mother stuff. How it's a th- it's a danger that they won't be brought, they won't get back. And so, with that in mind, he sort of points out what that person might start off as. That is someone who gets out there, uh, someone in the audience out there. Someone in that audience out there knows what we're doing, and that person is getting off on it beyond his or her wildest comp- wildest comprehensions. He's getting off it beyond his even ability to understand it. <laughs> and you know that yeah, turns like out they're, to- probably just, they're probably just laughing, and uh, the laughing is a sign of like a higher higher knowing yeah. that hasn't come down into the lower part of their brain yet. Right, and, and he's trying to, he's competing with what I will claim in 1985, I'll become the funniest person in the world. He's claiming, he's saying he's a candidate for that. He's going to make funny, and be, to make it the funniest thing ever, and that's important, to make them laugh. There, it's another thing. It is the situation that happens by, you know, the 80s and 90s when the Android meme is rampant. Uh, everybody is laughing beyond his or her wildest comprehensions because they don't understand why Reagan's president, why an actor is, and they don't understand what's going on, but they're just inter- <laughs> amusing themselves to death, right? That's right, yeah. exactly right. So, uh, anyways, I was glad, glad, let's go back to that great statement. Yeah, uh, that's great. The, pro- the project object. Maybe you like event slash organism. That's even what the kind of stuff they were saying in physics and uh, you know advanced uh, disciplines were saying event slash organism around then. So he was up on that. He probably looking at Scientific American and catching it in some specialized field. The project, which is process and object goal, so they they go together. Incorporates any available visual medium. That means magazine, books, movies. Television, what else? Uh, any visual thing. Painting. Uh, consciousness. Look at it. it. incorporates consciousness of all participants, including audience. That means that you're aware of the effects of what you're doing, like a Tetra manager. You're on the sensory level. You know when you do something in uh, England, you've got a visually biased culture, right? It's on the broad level. This is from the satellite conductor level. All perceptual deficiencies. Deficiencies. Biases, limitations, and it incorporates God as energy. Now, that is someone who really understands ion. I mean, who really understands what God is. It's your personal harnessing of powerful energy. Yeah. When you, like, that's, when I was describing Zappa walking busily, purposely, you know, leaving a concert, that was God as energy. I mean, he had energy, he had purpose, right? You, You bet, he had purpose. And it also incorporates incorporates swallows. So this is McLuhan essence taking all these analog uh, human scale situations and making it the content of his art. And then you go back to McLuhan's review of uh, William Burroughs and says all great art of the '60s and the TV era has to be Egyptian, which is which means that you take the whole universe as your content and you program it. That's the definition of real art. Uh, in uh, in why is that, era, why is that associated with the Egyptian? What you because that's what the, that's what the pharaoh did. The pharaoh would take the whole culture and, and make them all build a pyramid. <laughs> it, it's a it's a tribal view. It's to, it's you, you have to read the exact um, bunch of lines in that 1964 Nation magazine. Yeah, review. The whole culture was constellated around the imagination of the single pharaoh. Right. It's acoustic space. The, the emperor is not a leader, but he puts on the whole group, and everybody works toward the emperor. Zappa even talks about it in the Bob Marshall interview. He was amazed at this whole culture. Back in Egypt, you had to memorize all the stages of how you would die. He talks about that in the interview. You had to know all the names of the different things you'd encounter when you were dead. And he doesn't add this, but remember, it was all geared toward making sure the, the pharaoh survived death. Everybody was invested in it. Um, you know, this is before private identity. So the, the, the whole environment is programmed. You know the effects. You know what you're doing. McLuhan is saying that we were retrieving Egyptian sensibility when we got to the uh, Tetra manager level. So look at what he's including. He's including everything. The big note. He's including that as content, as universal basic building material. And other things. He, he doesn't limit it. He includes the mystery landscape. Yeah. Yeah. And well, then he says, 
Well, it's like the opening line of uh, Civilization Phase 3. It says, um, this is Phase 3. This is also dot, 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 and then he gets interrupted by John. So it's just like, this is also, what is it also? We don't get to the, you know, we've got to uh, find that out for ourselves. Let me see it's that. It's also like the, um, remember D.O. Fa, the, um, yeah. the abstract for D.O. Fa? He said, here's just a few ideas to get you started, kind of. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. This is the whole thing, but this is the, the first few ideas. Oh, I see what you mean. More. Yeah, I, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, he says, this is phase three. This is also, it's even more. Yeah. And uh, so then the other guy says, well, get through phase one and two first. Now, that <laughs> phase, yeah. phase one and two would be the, the Ant-Man and, and those mechanical imageries. Phase three would get into the electronic, you know, and sticking the transistor radio parts. Or maybe phase one is the, uh, is the industrial stuff, those uh, tools and things, and then phase two is the electric. Phase three, we're pushing for, is something beyond that. You know, well, you the, get to the maybe, trans- maybe phase. You have a. You maybe have, phase one is uh, pre-industrial because it's just a piano. No, no, that's industrial. The piano comes in with the industrial society. Industrial society begins okay, 200, no, 300 no, years ago. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And then phase two is the electronic, and phase three is the virtual uh, Android meme, and this is a virtual album. So this is phase three. You know, it's really good you pointed out because this is dealing with virtual reality. But this is also, that's our clue that's pointing to the mystery landscape. Yeah. And now just quickly, look, if you guys have got to look at the album cover. Oh, that's incredible, the album cover. Now, how do I see that? Oh, there it is, a small version. Um, Can I make it bigger? Uh, Should I click? You You know what? I clicked on the... Uh, the album cover and it shows and it comes up to every album that Zappa made yeah and, and you see In how his chronological order of release right and you see how his conceptual continuity digital technology made it you able to see it with, with yeah. this kind of effect that's what that, he anticipated that but look at it in reference to what we said about what you said about the pharaohs it's, it's like a, a pyramid yeah it's like a scene out of the bible yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's a big it's, piano. It's a big piano. Yeah. Yeah, big piano. There's like sort of architecture from various periods in there. Yeah. And then there's like potentially angels flying around smolting or Yeah, you know, UFOs, like the space, Dr. Beater yeah. scenario of cosmospheres yeah. you know, smashing the, the, the moon. Um but you know, I remember looking at close up that orange part underneath you know, the bottom Yeah. Right hand corner. I think cool. that is New yeah. York City. I can't make it out. Right. Okay. Yeah, I remember looking at it. It's a cityscape of Manhattan. I think, if I remember. I can't make it out here, but it, it, see, he's sh- he's he's sailing over a city like a tetra manager. Yeah. So yeah. see, so the piano. It's it's the archetypal, the mountain of industrial man of the establishment of the Grand Wazoo, in, yeah. maybe including the electronic. Well, it does. It's got the UFOs having a battle. It's almost like a uh, the uh, second coming battle, the Armageddon thing, you know, where the you gods know, come. Thought. It's the scene out of the Bible. It's the, it's the fire, the big fire, you know, that's just burning down Babylon, perhaps, or whatever. Right. Now, here's the other thing. Civilization, technically, when you use um, William Irwin Thompson's model, is the period from, uh, let's say, uh, 1500 B.C. up to the Electronic Age. He might not. He wouldn't. He wouldn't include the electronic because he calls that planetization. Planetization comes after civilization. Zappa is, is into having a global, you know, coherent society. But you've got this nations and all this old Gutenberg and ancient stuff, which is all under the rubric civilization. It's all under writing. So it's actually, you know, it's amazing you take this image and I could fit it into the chart and it's an illustration of the chart, even though we know the guy I did wasn't thinking anything about my stuff. But of course, all the work yeah. of the Android meme and Zap is part of the Android meme is uh, working for Bob. We, we now know that's true, right? So no matter what you thought you're doing, you're working towards uh, Bob's case. Look at that. Song five. Reagan at Bitburg. May Brussel made a big deal out of Bitburg. That's in May, May 1985 when Reagan went to the Nazi graveyard. And uh, 
everybody freaked on that, you know. And uh, even Zappa had to write a song about it. <clears throat> How the pigs' music. Should we, go in, should we go into maybe song three, Chad? Are we, we going to go use that one? Yeah. Uh, did I, I didn't hear you, James. Thing, though, Bob? James okay. said we should go, asked if I should go into song mm -hmm. three, but um, did you want to finish your thought first? Yeah, there was, I was just going to say in song eight, how the pig's music works. That's describing uh, who are the brain police, or an attempt to, at least acoustic space. Yeah. He's explaining something. Yeah. And, and, when, and when he was doing talking that way in the late 60s, I said to him, uh, uh, that's what Gurdjieff talked about the octaves and how humans were controlled by the octaves coming out of the moon and the sun or something. This hidden acoustic environment <clears throat> was romanticized uh, by Gurdjieff. And uh, he talks about that in the booklet story of Uncle Meat, uh, the uh, using of sounds to control people's functions. I mean, he talks about how scientists use acoustic space for scientific control or brain police purposes, but it's not the only brain police that Zapp is concerned about. Um, he, uh, let's see, uh, so he, uh, he just said no at, at the Gurdjieff level. And he was right. Gurdjieff was taught about acoustic space, but it was, it was romanticized back into the chemical body. Zappa understood the uh, technological brain police. That's why he had no problem saying AIDS was a conspiracy or the whole psychedelic yeah, yeah. culture was set up by MKUltra. He understood management at that level. And a lot of that was because he knew yeah. me, and I told him that stuff. But there's another quote. I just remembered one. He, he gives his definition of the problems in society. Uh, in the Wally book. And he, his inventory is really, he covers everything uh, about what, what causes the problems. So let's just try to put that in. Um, it would be um, uh, television, um, the church, ignorance, maybe something like that, ignorance. Put in Zappa to see if that brings up the quote. Hmm. Uh, actually, you know, no, I don't think I have the book here. I could go and get the book. It's in Wally's book. So, okay, what's tell Zappa? What's wrong? Uh, the problems are caused by. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, what might approximate it. No, I'm not getting it. But he lists, uh, he covers a whole range of things. It's like uh, like taking all the quadrants in my char chart. He says, you know, the, the, the world is, there's problems because of religion, television, some, uh, incompetence, government. He just runs, and basically says everything causes the problem. But he names the right nouns. Okay, so uh, I rest my uh, temporary case, and we shall what go and do the next song. Okay. Or okay. We have a the next to, song. Uh, uh, should we just have a little taste of uh, "Put a Murder in Yourself"? Yeah, the next song. Well, what is the next song? Well, the next song has no lyrics. It's called "Put a Motor in Yourself," so it just takes off from the end of the dialogue in the first song. But it's it's a Five pretty good uh, composition. It's a good just play a little bit perhaps and just uh, give the audience who's listening maybe something to chew on. Yeah, like pay, play half of it. Yeah, okay. play the first minute. All right, here we go. Number two, you put a motor in yourself. <laughs>
I'll cut it at that point. It sounds uh, it sounds a lot more like jazz from hell than uh, the first part certainly did. It's interesting the contrast between that lumpy gravy dialogue in the first track and then going right into this jazz from hell kind of style. The full sync of ear, very quick. Yeah, the how, if we are supposed to match the music with the title, how does that music illustrate putting a motor in yourself? It just sounds very kinetic. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah, I think of... It's very, um, energetic, very energetic, it's bouncing. It sounds like you're cruising along the L.A. highways listen to the radio and grooving, which is what, you know, I've mentioned before, Miles, Barry Miles says, the core sensibility in Zappa is the life of uh, the car culture of L.A. His music has the rhythms of cruising. Yeah, I didn't get, I didn't get Southern Cal cruising a car in Southern California, cruising necessarily out of that. But all these parts bouncing around in relation to one another, yeah, that's your that's that. your sensory data. The different part. You look over here, you see that scene. You look over there, you move, your head's moving around, seeing it's all the environment whiz by. What? It sort of expresses uh, quadrophenia with all the time changes. Um, but it's the only song on the album where it's got a, uh, a constant pulsating rhythm. Yeah, and that's um, the kinetic part. Yeah. yeah, I agree. That's the motor. Yeah. Yeah. Perpetual motion. Hmm. But I guess it's also displaying all the different motors that people are putting in themselves. And, you know, uh, yeah, from Valium. And from, runs and licks. And, yeah, yeah. From Valium to listening to rock or putting a motor yeah. in yourself. Yeah. It's the bliss of the electronic age, the ecstasy. <laughs> but it also, I kind of agree with Bob about how it is like a car moving on the highway, but I would think more in terms of, you know, when you do an overhead shot of the freeway and you put it in fast, yeah, yeah. like you speed it up to like triple time and it makes all the cars look like they're moving yeah. fast, like time-lapse photography. Yeah. So the cars look like little yeah. particles kind of zooming in and through the intersection. I can see that. Yeah, he's oh, making yeah. me... Almost like... Uh, I almost get the image of uh, uh, when they... Uh, do what do they call it when they speed up the camera? They take a, a frame every 30 seconds. And at an intersection mm -hmm. with uh, traffic, uh, lights turning red, lights turning green, traffic moving, people walking across the streets, uh, the sun moving across the sky, sort of an yeah, accelerated it's pace. Like do 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 yeah, it's like going through exactly. the whole world in that in, in that in that style, you know, showing it, all the individuals in the different forms at that sped up speed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what I meant. Mm. He he's showing he he's making music, expressing the hidden rhythms and seductions and brain police influences of the modern environment, in American yeah. environment, anyways. Yeah, it's a new it's a new image yeah. of driving around in your car compared to the 1960s one of driving around cruising slowly with your top off on you know the convertible open. Yeah. So you can be seen. Whereas the new image in the car is bopping around like a little particle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It does, it's not limited to the U.S. I think for me that evokes the whole world. Yeah, any city, any modern city, and around the world. Yeah. 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 Have you seen, nice, yeah, have you, when he went on Johnny Carson, one of those shows near the end, he played the footage for uh, the G-spot or is it the end light? Maybe it was the end light. He, he, he showed this footage to go with the music. And what it was, it was um, camera work done by Zappa of Don of Captain Beefheart and his girlfriend Laura or whatever her name was at a fairground, you know, in the late fifties. And it shows it sounds, it has footage it's familiar, what? Yeah. 
It sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah go, and it's, it occasionally shows footage of Beefheart in his car with his girlfriend cruising around Lancaster or someplace, and Frank's filming him yeah. in a car cruising. I, I, I think it's G Spot Tornado um, from. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, G spot. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the word tornado clinches it for me. I think that's what it was. G spot tornado. But I had never thought of this before. But this point about driving around—that's in the footage that he took. You know, thirty years before, sixty to nine. Yeah, thirty years before, and uh, he has this music. But that's what he's showing: fairy go round, merry go rounds, fairgrounds, city lights, street cruising, and beef are just you know being the king in the middle of it, just having bliss, just driving around, cruising around with his girlfriend. And that's yeah. and that's what that's the footage that he put with the music. That proves our point. Yeah. yeah. Also, just is a good point where it's uh, remember how he commercialized on that scene, and so it's it's also a, maybe a, a acoustic uh, symbolism of the commercialization inside the cities.